Well, thank you everybody for joining us here at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy. It's a beautiful day. The turning of the leaves here, if you're able to visit, is quite amazing. And we're coming to you live from the Shrine of Divine Mercy. And today is a very important topic, um, one of the most significant in human history. And the salvation of billions of souls at risk or stake or in the balance. This talk today is on Martin Luther. Now, we're not here to condemn anybody. We're here to give pure factual teaching. Anything I say here, you can easily reference. I just went through a bunch of my notes, working with our theologians and compiled so that you don't have to spend weeks doing research, but can listen to this talk and get an idea of what who Martin Luther was and what his teachings were and how that differs from the church. And especially if you saw the slide versus St. Therese, it's actually quite fascinating. So let's begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you send the Holy Spirit down upon us and through the intercession of St. Therese to be able to open our minds and hearts and to keep the souls to the truth of your church. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, let's begin right away with our first slide. If Brother Mark could put on the screen, who's this? Obviously, Martin Luther King Jr. Now, what most people don't know is that's not his real name. His real name was Michael. And he was named by his mother after the archangel Saint Michael. So the screen you're looking at there is Michael King. Now his dad, when he was young, traveled to Germany and fell in love with the message of Martin Luther and renamed himself and his son Martin Luther. So this is Martin Luther King Jr. So he was named after him, and it wasn't even his real name. So I thought that's interesting to start with that fact, because what it shows is that Martin Luther has influenced millions of people. Now we're going to talk about how. All right, let's look at our next slide. Here's Martin Luther. He was born uh, as a peasant. Um, in Germany in 1483, okay? His father was a miner, like my great-grandfather was, um, was a miner from Croatia up in the Minnesota mines, and he was actually murdered. Uh, my grandfather grew up an orphan because he was trying to form labor unions. And what this father did of Martin Luther was wanted his son to pursue a career in law, specifically canon law, but it never happened. You want to know why? A severe thunder, so he was all set. He was studying law, canon law, and a thunderstorm hit, and it was so terrified him. This shows the fragile nature that he was. This storm so terrified him to such a degree that he vowed to God that if he survived the storm, he'd become a monk. <laughs> I mean, I think we've all done that at one time or another. Lord, just get me through this calculus test, and I promise I'll become a priest. You know, so no, that, I mean, we've all done it, but that's not a true calling. So the very origin of his calling is questionable. It was because of a thunderstorm. So that's the first thing that we have to call into question. Now in 1505 then, he joined the Augustinians. This is one of the original monast um, monastic communities in the church for a life of prayer, study, and fasting. And he did become a priest. But here's where it started to get messy. All right, he came to believe that he had to earn his salvation by his own efforts. And this is what Protestants still accuse us Catholics of. His misunderstanding has pervert, what do you call it? Uh, per, uh, um, per, persevered to the present day. Perdured, I think is the word. All the way to the present day, this misunderstanding, this is not what us Catholics teach. 
Yes, there's a rule of good works, but we're going to explain that. Now, the more he tried through prayer, fasting, and good works, the more unacceptable to God he felt himself to be. Why? Because he failed. This is scrupulosity, though. Be careful. You know how many times I have failed on a winter morning wanting to get into a cold shower? And I turn the shower on cold and it's freezing and I'm like, okay, I can't do it. And I turn the hot water on. Don't let that, because you fail in great penances, think that God doesn't accept you. That was this whole issue. It's a shame that the whole church shattered because of a misunderstanding. Now, there's more to it, and we'll start talking about that. Now, his um, own personal study of St. Paul, however, he was looking for a way out of this trap. And so he started studying St. Paul, and he read St. Paul. This is the danger of your own interpretation. This is why we need a magisterium. Because he began to interpret Paul in his own way, and he began to believe that the righteousness of God, which Paul wrote about, especially in Romans 1.17, referred to the righteousness by which the sinner is graciously justified by faith alone, not by works, even though the book of James says faith without works is dead. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. Now, this understanding or misunderstanding transformed his life. He now found peace saying, now I can not worry about sin. I mean, in one sense, you can understand that. He found peace with God through just saying it's only faith. Now, the medieval commentators actually really didn't disagree with this. See, this is the, this is the interesting thing. The Catholic view is not that different. So what, what are we talking about here? Okay, we are all saved not by our own efforts. The Catholic Church agrees to that. But there's a difference. Where Martin Luther says faith alone, which the Bible doesn't say that, he, Martin Luther added the word alone. We'll talk about that. Catholics believe we are saved by grace. And how do we get grace? The Bible tells us. The sacraments. All right, now, we're all saved by grace. By God's, by God's righteousness, not ours. God's righteousness does not condemn us. wants to save us. So we Catholics, we are saved by grace. We are not saved by faith alone or Bible alone. That's not in the Bible. The Bible does not say you are saved by faith alone. Father, Chris, yes it does. Romans 3, 28. You are saved by faith alone and not by works. That's not what Romans 3.28 says. Even though every time I'm challenged by it, I'm told that's what it says. It doesn't. The original language of Romans 3.28 says you are saved by faith. It does not say the word alone. Martin Luther added it. And not by works of the law. You kind of forget that little part. Martin Luther kind of forgot that little part. Works of the law. We Catholics believe that. So when you're challenged on Romans 3.28, you are not, you are, excuse me, you are saved by faith alone and not by works. We shudder. We put our head in the sand like an ostrich. Your answer has to be, well, first of all, that's not what Romans 3.28 says. Firstly, Romans 3.28 says you are saved by faith and not by works of the law. We believe that. All right, now, Catholics, all right, saving faith for us has to be a living faith like it was for the Jews. Belief in God to the Jews wasn't just, I believe in God and professing it with your lips. It was living it in your actions. So a saving faith has to be a living faith. And a living faith is shown by your good works, by your good works, not of the law, works of love. See, it's, I can't get over the fact that this whole splintering and shattering of the church in the perhaps loss of billions of souls all came from something so close that was misunderstood by this gentleman. 
It's amazing. Grace causes good works. The grace of God, if it's active in us, we will do, we will love our neighbor. Doesn't it say in the Bible, the two great commands, what? Love God and love your neighbor, but I don't believe in good works. Well, then what is love your neighbor? Love your neighbor is good works. Jesus commanded it, love God, love your neighbor. Well, I don't believe in good works. Well, then how do you love your neighbor? Just saying I love you? Saying is empty promises. I could tell you all day long, that I love you, but when you call on me or you, 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 you come to me and I'm not there for you, does that really show love? It shows in our will. Our words are just words. Our actions are our will. Love is an act of the will. You've heard me say this before. So grace causes the good works. Simple as just loving your neighbor. Good works doesn't cause the grace. Grace causes the good works. This is the, you want to know the whole difference between Protestants and Catholics? And God bless them, they accuse us Catholics all the time. You think you're going to earn your way into heaven. You think your works are going to get you into heaven. It's all because they think, we think, our works are going to get God's grace. What we really believe is the opposite. God's grace gives us the ability to do God's will through good works. So it's flipped. What we really believe is not what they think we believe. And so what we believe is it is God's grace that allows us to do good works and good works is needed because Jesus, Paul says, if you do not love your neighbor, you're a liar. Okay, this is fascinating stuff. Okay, so here's the point. We can't manage saving faith on our own. We can't just profess it. It comes through baptism, faith, hope, and charity. That's why the Bible says you, to get to heaven, you must be baptized of the Spirit. That's how you get faith. It's not just proclaimed in your words. Faith is a grace given at your baptism. Faith, hope, and love. We need those. Those are supernatural theolo theological virtues. Now, we need the aid of grace, but then we must cooperate. Do you think any baptized people go to hell? Certainly. Why? I thought you just said, Father, that was the grace to get to heaven. It is if you cooperate with it. Do you think anybody who says, I profess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior has never committed a mortal sin, didn't repent, and may be lost? Of course they are. And so Martin Luther insisted that human beings contributed nothing to their own justification. That's not biblical. You must cooperate with the grace God gives you. Paul says right in the scriptures, licentiousness, envy, lust. These people will not inherit the kingdom of God. We just read it in the mass a couple days ago. It's right from St. Paul. So I want to share with you something fascinating. I told you before that I, I, I scour the internet. I scour my notes. I speak with theologians. Each talk I do, I prepare tons for it so that you don't have to do all the work yourself. We're doing it for you. And I want to share with you one of the best ones I have found. Uh, actually, Chris Sparks, our theologian, found it. It's by Luke Lancaster. And he did a comparison. Listen to this article he wrote. The scruples of Martin Luther and St. Therese. They both had scrupulosity. They both feared God. Only one of these two famous figures overcame scrupulosity and a crippling fear of God in a healthy way. Martin Luther, St. Therese. Let's look at this. All right, so here's the next picture. So I put, Brother Mark, I put on the screen, there's St. Therese, one of the great saints, and she faced the exact same issue as Martin Luther. Let's talk about this, the scruples. All right, in the church's long history, this is all coming from Luke Lancaster. Two figures stand out that have affected the church maybe more than any other than Christ, Mary, Joseph themselves, and that is St. Therese and Martin Luther. Not, I'm not saying in a good way, but, but, but affected. Both were obsessed with their sins. Martin Luther was obsessed with the sins, and so was St. Therese. Terrified of divine justice. All right, they were doubtful that they could ever earn God's love. Both of them were the same, the exact same. But their paths diverged greatly once they learned about church teaching. All right, 
won through the church into turmoil and brought devastation to the whole world while the other attained eternal glory as a great saint. These are the words of Luke Lancaster. What led Luther to promote that faith to the exclusion of human works is what saves? Uh Uh-uh. It seems to be found in Luther's life and personality. This is why he took it. What led Luther to believe that faith alone is all that's needed, he said, seems to be found in Luther's personal life and his personality. He was a monk in a monastery, ridden with anxiety, trying to gain peace by living a Catholic lifestyle, and he wasn't finding it. How many of all of you out there are facing anxiety or depression? Like, I just can't stop sinning. I give up. I quit. I'm going to go to the New Hope Church down the street. You know, a very close personal friend of mine in high school, she was, meant the world to me. I haven't talked to her in years. Found out that she left the Catholic faith. She's now at some New Hope Church And it's devastating because she was the strongest Catholic, never missed mass. Whenever there's an internal turmoil, we want to run because we hang our head and say, I just can't do it, so I'm going to go find some place that doesn't make me feel guilty. No! This is a classic misconception of church teaching and Catholicism. It's not Catholic guilt. All of you have heard the term. Well then, Father, how do you break out of this? Then what do I do if it's not Catholic guilt? I'm supposed to hang my head in penance. No, let's talk about what St. Therese did. Fascinating. Now, Martin Luther, before we get to Therese, he wasn't at peace. He thought every action was sinful and he could not obtain God's favor. Sound like some of us? He would go to confession every day, sometimes even for hours. Please don't do that to the person behind you in the confessional line. (laughs) Please don't do that. Scrupulosity. Okay. He said, as a monk, I thought salvation impossible when I felt the concupiscence of the flesh. That is, any evil movement, meaning action or thought, whether it be lust, anger, or envy against another person. He believed that just having temptation was sinful. I hear that all the time in the confessional. Father, these thoughts, they come in my mind. I had to come to confession today because this thought came in my mind. I said, okay, what did you do with that thought? Well, I rejected it. Well, then you didn't sin. The devil has access to your intellect. I just said this in a homily the other day, Wednesday. Through Friday? Yesterday, I guess. The devil has access to your intellect. He doesn't have access to your will. The devil cannot make you do it. Therefore, things that come into your mind are not sinful unless you draw them in or indulge in them. Because then it goes to the heart. That's when it gets in. That's what Jesus said, the heart Not the head. Jesus never said the head condemns you. He said the heart does. If you bring it into the head and you let it stay there and you dwell on it and you let it go into the heart, yeah, you're in trouble. Or for the good. I know I need to help somebody. I'm going to let it go into my heart. Now you're doing good acts of love, acts of works. So she believed just the, or Martin Luther believed just the temptation was condemning him to hell. Jesus faced temptation. It's not. It's not. That would mean Jesus sinned. All right? This anxiety is what's called scrupulosity. And it's what psychologists call obsessive compulsive disorder. Obsessive compulsive disorder. We all know it, right? It's understandable that salvation by faith alone would appeal to Martin Luther or any Christian crippled with guilt over every action, but this is not what the church teaches. What does the church teach? We're going to tell you through St. Therese. Luther thought he could find passages in Scripture to back him up. So what did he do? He went right to the book of Paul, the writings of Paul, and he said, Romans 117, the righteous shall live by faith. 
Well, yeah, we agree to that. Then he went to Romans 3.28. We just said this. A man is justified by faith alone and not by works. No, it's not what it says. It's by faith and not by works of the law. We believe that. What about Galatians 2.16? He pulled that one out. A man is not justified by works of the law. But again, you have to add the law. We believe that too. We don't believe you're justified by being circumcised. That's works of the law or washing your hands seven times. But through faith in Jesus, that's Galatians 2.16, we believe that. That doesn't go against church teaching. It's misinterpreted. Notice that these are works of the law. He, the Bible never says or condemns good works. Paul says you need good works. James says works without faith without works is dead. So this is the difference. What we're comparing here is Catholics, we see works as works of love. When we're accused of focusing on works, we're, 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 they read it in the Bible, it's works of the law. You will never hear me say you got to wash your hands seven times to get to heaven. You won't hear me say that. All right, by Luther's interpretation, faith and faith alone was the way to achieve heaven. All right, therefore he did not need to continue with good works. This is a grave mistake. And we're talking about works, not just of the law, works of love. And yes, some sacrifices, fasting, and penances, penances are good too. All right, let's look at our next slide. So what about faith alone? That's what the slide says. Sola fide. Is that true? No, it's not. Jesus never taught it. The scriptures contradict it. And this article says Luther led countless souls astray by promoting it. If only he could have found St. Therese first. Let's look at this. She was also living in the religious life, just like Martin Luther, and she too was crippled. Crippled. She was anxious about her sins. What a great connection this guy's making. One of the best I've seen. He said, in St. Therese's The Story of a Soul, which I led as a novice, but I didn't pick this up, she had first struggled a lot with fear of God, just like Martin Luther. However, she conquered her scruples and lived believing in God's love and obeying the church. Therese initially had a strong obsession with sin, fearing every little thing she did was offensive to God. We all know the type if you're not one yourself. All right. His justice terrified her and was always on her mind. But she prayerfully discerned with the help of her sisters and her spiritual director that she didn't need to earn God's love. But worries Catholics are accused of saying this or teaching this. She knew God loved her already. She figured this out. Martin Luther didn't. From this, Therese developed her spirituality and uh, I've done a talk on this. A strategy of loving God in a little way. Not through great penances, but little acts of love. While Luther, as a monk, had been trying to impose severe penances on himself and failed and then despaired, including long fasts, sleeping without a blanket, Therese recognized that she was too little for these things, right? She could only choose to make small little acts, but she said, I will do them with great love. That's the whole key. That's what Martin Luther missed. Good works were good to her, not to be condemned, but only if they were done with great love. This is, again, what Martin Luther missed. Even the little things, even like picking up a pen. I explained the other day, I couldn't figure that out in the vision. How is picking up a pen an act of great love? And then it occurred to me that God's universe is so out of disorder because of sin that everything's out of order. And if you pick up a pen and put it back in its drawer, in the smallest, tiniest of way, you're putting order back into God's universe. You see that? Just think what you do if you order your life 
based on virtue, way better than a pen. But she did it as small as a little pen putting into a drawer. Fascinating. Now, both Martin Luther and St. Therese would say that the efficacy of works depends on the grace of God. They agreed to that, both of them. Therese never said her works got her to heaven. She knew God's grace did. But Luther went further and said that those acts that she was talking about meant nothing. They meant nothing. Therese said, there are some called to do great acts, but not her. She said, they're beyond me. Mighty works only have value in the fact that God gives you the grace. But Luther said, you will never do meritorious works. Now, Therese then cast off her terror of God's justice. She fled from it and she said, what sweet joy it is to think that God is just. That is, he takes into account our weakness. That's why God's mercy is his justice. Did you ever wonder that? Did you ever hear that? God's mercy is his justice. When I came to the Miriam's house, I was like, Father Seraphim, you gotta help me with this one. How in the heck is God's mercy is his justice. And Father Seraphim explained to me beautifully, he says, okay, you got two soldiers on the battlefield. One broke a fingernail, the other is hemorrhaging to death. Who has the right to the medic? I said, the one hemorrhaging to death. He said, exactly. The mercy to heal those two guys resulted in the justice that the guy more hurt gets the medic. That's just. It's not just that the guy with the hurt fingernail got the medic. That's not just. Just is that the guy dying got the medic. But it was based on the mercy that there should be a medic. <laughs> you see that? Fascinating. So she says, it takes into account, God's justice takes into account our weakness. He knows perfectly the fragility of our nature. What should I be afraid of? Amazing amazing. And so all of this is so powerful. Although she knew that God, and you know, I want to interrupt here by saying, please, when I'm talking to about today, when I say Protestants, I'm not talking about all Protestants. I always get condemned for this. I'm talking about in general, the split from the Catholic church, what I lump into Protestants, there's 40,000 different denominations now. The teaching, what I'm saying here, does not apply. Somebody will write me the, 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 the new hope of the twilight zone of this community, of this church, does not believe that, Father Chris. Okay, I get that. I'm not trying to say that. But in general, this is the, the concepts. Okay, so although St. Therese knew that God took sin seriously, all right, it's not a freedom to sin like Martin Luther wanted to try to justify. She did not let that blind her from his mercy. God is just, but I'm not going to run away because he's also mercy. For when she offended God, you know how she reacted? She didn't run and hide. She didn't leave the church saying, I can't do it. When she failed in her penances, she didn't say, I give up like Martin Luther, you know what she did? <laughs> she imagined herself as a little child. This is why we call it the little way. With tears running down her cheeks that ran to God's arms in the confessional. Whoa. Luther, on the other hand, went to confession frozen, terrified, ultimately dissatisfied with God's forgiveness and left the church. Interesting. Now, this is not to say that God excuses all sin on account of people's weaknesses. That's not what Therese said. She knew that God is just. She said, if a man doesn't repent of his sins, then he will get God's justice. Luther, however, obsessed over God's justice. He didn't let God's mercy in, feeling as if none of good works would ever be sufficient. Hmm. Therese knew that God was merciful and pleased with just her desire to love him. You know what? If you got nothing else, if you got nothing else 
You fail every time you get next to your coworker. You lose your patience every time you get in that traffic jam. If you fall in chastity, every struggle you have, even if you got nothing, say to God, at least I desire to please you. Even if I fail over and over and over and over, just the desire. You know, there's a funny story, and I don't know if theologically if this is correct, so please take this with a grain of salt. There was a story of a priest, and we are not allowed to give absolution in the confessionals. This only happened to me one time as a priest. If somebody refuses to try to change, try to change. So the story was this priest was in the confessional, this young teenager or young adult came in and confessed his sins and the priest said okay then you know are you going to try to change he said father I can't I know I'm going to do it again and the priest said hmm well we don't always succeed but will you at least try and the guy said father I'm not going to lie to you I'm only here because my mom's pushing me into the confessional here. I can't give up my girlfriend. I can't do it. I've tried. I'm too weak. I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I can't even try. I'm too weak. And the priest went, hmm. And I can't really give you absolution if you can't even try. And the guy says, no. And he says, are you sorry that you did this? And he says, well, not really because I enjoy it so much. And the priest is now really scratching his head. And he says, okay, are you at least sorry that you're not sorry? <laughs> and the boy said, yeah, that I definitely am. Now, I'm not saying this is theologically correct, but you get the point. The point is that God even sees our desire if I'm in that confessional every day because I keep falling, but I have the desire, Lord, I don't want to offend you anymore. I'm trying, I'm trying. You don't think God sees that? That's the beauty of it. Okay, so let's keep finishing. St. Therese, just a beautiful example. Sorry I get so worked up with this, but it's just, it is so much in my heart, this, this example and what's happening in our world today, turning away from our faith. It's, it's unreal. All right, now, she knew that God was just, and she knew. So Therese imagined her, okay, here's what it is. She desired to love God, even imperfectly, through her prayers, her confessions, and her fasts. Little good works. Let's look at our next slide. Her good works. The little way. I did a whole talk on this. If you missed it, there it is. There's a picture of it. St. Therese of Lisieux, follow the little way. It's a talk I did I think it was last year, and you can find it on YouTube. God says that her little works would make God smile more tenderly at her to see her as his little daughter. Wow. Her works stem not from fear, but from a heart overflowing with love. That's the Catholic way. All right. She represents the true Catholic teaching on salvation, which Luther never understood. That's why he left. You know, Protestant theologian R.C. Sproul, this is a Protestant now, recounted this after studying Martin Luther. Quote, he had such a fear of the wrath of God that early in his ministry, somebody put this question to him. Brother Martin, do you love God? You know what he said? Love God? You ask me if I love God? Sometimes I hate God. I see Christ as a consuming judge who is simply looking at me to evaluate me and put affliction upon me. Is that the Catholic teaching of God? It's what we told it is, but no, it's not. What a stark difference between Therese and Luther. Luther was dominated by fear, and he left the faith. Therese wanted only to please her loving father, God the Father, and this got her to heaven as a saint. 
You know, our temptations, as I said a minute ago, are by themselves are not sinful. This point is often misunderstood, and it's a major difference between Catholic and Protestant theology. All right, let's go to our next slide. What is this? Oh, that's moguls on a ski course, Father. Actually, that's snow-covered dung. Snow-covered dung hills. This is how Martin Luther described mankind. Whereas the Catholics believe through confession and grace, we can be transformed. Martin Luther says we're never transformed. We're always a pile of crap. Sorry for the language. Pile of dung. God just sprinkles snow over it. That's not what the Bible teaches. Let's look at this. We are not a snow-covered dung hill. Most Protestants, again, not all, not all, Consider concupiscence. What is concupiscence? That's our tendency to sin since the original sin. Our, our tendency to be lazy, to be selfish, to be lustful, to be gluttonous, to be greedy. That's concupiscence, our tendency. Many Protestants, not all, believe that that itself is sinful because of Martin Luther. Martin Luther was tormented for many years by his inability to overcome his fallen nature. He found peace only in the thought that man is a depraved being and cannot avoid sin. The gospel tells us, go and sin no more. Why would Jesus tell us something? Now, are we going to fall? Yes. But we have to see what God has commanded us to do, and the more we strive for it, the less we will sin. So Martin Luther and other reformers were convinced that even our good works are nothing but sin themselves. How could good works be sin? Well, I guess if you have a personal, like you're doing good works because you want your picture in the paper. This doctrine is known as total depravity. And it is accepted, as I said, by many Protestants. In this view, man's only hope for salvation is confessing his faith and believing in God and Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. It's a start, but it's far from the finish line. Faith, he said, covers over filth of whatever sins may have corrupted my soul. I'm a pile of dung. And that dung will never change. I'm always going to be dung. And God just sprinkles a little snow over it. No, we believe in the sacraments that they can actually transform us. Well, Father, my husband goes to the sacraments and he's certainly not transformed. You gotta cooperate with the grace. This is the key. This is a far cry from the Catholic understanding of forgiveness, this snow covered dunghill in which Jesus, we believe, wipes the sin completely away through the sacraments, especially confession. We are transformed. Hmm. Luther's teachings skewed this understanding of the relationship between faith and works. Listen to a couple quotes. This is from Luther work, Luther's works, volume 29, page 126. It does not matter what people do. Really? It does not matter what people do. Well, sorry, but that's not what it says in the Bible. It only matters what they believe. No, that's not in the Bible. Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. Matthew 25 says, you did not care for my, the least of my brethren, you did not care for me, away with you into the eternal fire. This is not scriptural. Let's look at our next slide. Listen to this one. This one blows me away. Be a sinner and sin boldly. What? This is a quote. Martin Luther, be a sinner and sin boldly. Now he does follow up by saying, but have stronger faith and rejoice in Jesus Christ, who is the victor of sin, death, and the world. Do not for a moment imagine that this life is the abiding place of justice. Ah, uh, yeah, it is. Sin must be committed. What? Sin must be committed. Sin cannot tear you away from him. Yes, that's true. If you cooperate with the grace to come back to him. 
and repent. Sin cannot tear you away from him, even though you commit adultery a hundred times a day. Hmm. And commit as many murders. This is from a letter from Luther in 1521. Whoa, it's kind of interesting. Luther's words, we just read, they're shocking. They're shocking to us Catholics, and they undermine our understanding of free will. And this is why the Calvinists behind the Lutheran movement rejected free will. They said, you're predestined for heaven or hell. You can't do anything about it. That's not Catholic teaching. All right? If the way we act is not within our control, then what the heck are we doing? Then what the heck's the purpose of the Bible? If the way you act is not in your control, then what is the purpose of the Bible that is telling us to be good and avoid evil? Thomas, St. Thomas More considers Luther's denial of free will to be, quote, the very worst and most mischievous heresy that was ever thought upon and also the most maddening. Wow. The danger of once saved, always saved, having this belief, is that it causes a disconnect between how one lives and what one believes. They got to be together. That's what the Jews taught. If it is impossible for me to overcome sin, and I don't have the ability to control my decisions, and through my faith I'm assured of salvation, then what keeps me from living a completely duplicitous life that Jesus warned against. Don't be duplicitous like the Pharisees. They say one thing and they do another. Wait a minute, this is exactly the message of Christ. The Pharisees said one thing, they did another. What did Jesus rail against the Pharisees? Jesus railed not against the weakened sinner who hung his head down and said, I'm sorry. Jesus railed against the Pharisees who said one thing and did another. He said, woe to you who put burdens on people but don't lift a finger to help them. We must use our free will to choose what is good and holy and to avoid what is evil. You know what? Even some Protestants agree with this. In 1999, the Joint Declaration of the Doctrine of Justification signed by both the Roman Catholic Church and the Worldwide Lutheran Federation and by the Methodist Church in 2006 said this. Let's look at our next slide. We Roman Catholics and Protestants of the Lutheran Church believe and confess that by grace alone, in faith in Christ's saving works, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit, who then renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to do good works. Even some Protestants see that truth fascinating quote. All right, there was another article I want to talk about. This is from William Most, and this was talking about Lutheranism. Now, he said to Luther that this discovery of justification by faith alone meant a ton to him personally because he wanted to justify living in sin. And by 1985, another joint commission of Lutheran and Catholic theologians admitted, and let's read their quote. Next slide. The major function of justification by faith, or faith alone, was rather to console anxious consciences, terrified by the inability to do enough to earn or merit salvation. The starting point for Luther was his inability to find peace with God. He was terrified in his own conscience. That was quoted by Lutherans. Oh, maybe there is hope for us to come together. This is why Luther left the church 
Everybody says Luther left the church because he was selling indulgences. We'll get to that in a moment. No, Martin Luther didn't leave because we were selling indulgences, and we'll talk about that. He said that he couldn't belong to a religion that said he was going to hell because he couldn't confess every sin he ever committed. Okay, I can't either. I can't belong to a religion that told, would tell me that if I don't confess right now every single sin I've ever committed, I'm going to hell. I agree with Martin Luther. The problem is, that's not what the Catholic Church teaches. What does the Catholic Church teach about forgotten sins? Now, don't have selective memory. You just kind of want to forget about a sin. No, if it's there, confess it. But the church teaches if you honestly do a good examination of conscience, and that's a requirement, just don't be gabbing in the confession line, listening, reading your cell phone, and then quick run in and confess your sins. You've got to do a good examination of conscience. If you really do reflect on your days and your, and your life and you, you think of your sins and you confess every grave sin you can remember, you are forgiven even if you don't remember them all. Martin Luther never knew this. What a shame that he left the Catholic Church for a misunderstanding. He thought he was, the church taught he was condemned to hell because he couldn't remember every sin to confess it. That's not what the church teaches. All right? This is not church teaching. He was scrupulous that he was constantly in mortal sin justification by faith for him and it made no difference if he sinned mortally all the time or not. So it was his way out. He thought, I'm constantly living in mortal sin. And you know what? Don't be scrupulous. I, in the confession, I, I, I've said this before, but I, I'm pretty good at picking when somebody confesses, I always ask them, now, have you confessed this sin before? Uh, yes, Father. Have you committed it since 10 years ago when you did it? Uh, no, Father. You don't confess it again. You don't need to. If you do, you're showing you don't trust that God has forgiven you. Trust that God has forgiven you. Powerful. So justification by faith alone meant for him, now it doesn't matter if I sin or not mortally because I'm covered with snow, my dung. No, we gotta be transformed. This is the difference. If he would take, just take Christ as his personal Lord and Savior, then the merits of Christ would be thrown on him like a light cloak, he believed, like a snow dung hill, as I keep saying. That's all he believed you had to do, it's not true. He could not be lost, he believed. He was saved no matter how much he would sin. Now, of course, not like apostasy or something. But this is, this is um, oh, did I miss one? Um, number 10. Um, let me see here. Number 10. No, that's it. I got number 10, the major. Okay, so let's look at our next slide, number 11. So look at this quote. Martin Luther's quote, sin greatly but believe more greatly. <laughs> uh -uh. If you believe greatly, you're not going to say, I want to sin greatly. I mean, we may have the desire to, but we use our will. In other words, Christians can sin as much as they want and get away with it. This is not correct. This is justification. You know how ironic the word justification. When he says justification, he's talking about the Lord justifying us to get to heaven. I'm calling it rationalization. All right, so we are just snow-covered dung. Now, did Paul mean this? Not really. Let's look at what Paul said. He spoke of Christians as a new creation, not a snow-covered dunghill, but a completely new creation in 2 Corinthians 5, Galatians 6. They are made over from scratch. 
They are not at all merely the same old corruption. We're renewed. What did Jesus say in the movie, The Passion, that's come from the scripture? I make all things new. He didn't say, I sprinkle the old dung and it's still dung. I make it new. I transform it. He says that, the, Paul says, we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit lives in us. This is 1 Corinthians 3 and 6 and 2 Corinthians 6. Can we imagine the Holy Spirit living in us if we were nothing but dung? That's why we, when we're not out in a state of grace, the Holy Spirit's not in us. When we're guilty of mortal sin, the Holy Spirit leaves us. That's not by his choice. We force him out. But confession brings the Holy Spirit back. As long as we're sorry, we confess all grave sins that we can remember, and we, do, we have some form of contrition. We're sorry. You have those three things. So he says, well, I don't need some church. Really, this is what God tells us in Scripture, the book of James. After talking about the priests, the book of James says, confess your sins to one another. Matthew 16, 19, Matthew 18, 18, John 20, 23, whose sins you forgive are forgiven, whose sins you retain are retained. Who is he talking to? The priests. All right? So if we remained a dunghill full of mortal sin, no, the Holy Spirit's not in us. We got to go back to confession, be transformed, and then the Holy Spirit comes back. To find out what Paul really meant when he talked about faith, read it. Read where he does, okay? 1 Thessalonians 2.13, 2 Corinthians 5.7, Galatians 5.5, 5, Romans 5.1, Romans 1.5, 6.16, Galatians 5.6. How does Paul talk about faith? Read. He uses faith as a mix of belief, confidence, love, and obedience. Far cry from what non-Catholics believe. So does James. James says the same thing. What he thought was a great discovery was actually just a great mistake. And his whole system stands or falls on this error. He himself admitted this. The problem is it's not based on the Bible. The Bible is clear. Faith itself includes obedience to God's commands. Paul says it. And obedience is a good work. <gasps> so good works are important. Yes, not because they earn your way into heaven, but because God's grace that comes to you through the sacraments results in you doing good works. You see that? All right, let's go on. Sola Scriptura. Next slide. This is, this is a favorite one. This is another pillar of Luther's position. Scripture alone. How can it be both faith alone and Scripture alone? He has two alones. That's another problem. We Catholics believe in Scripture, but not alone. We believe in faith, but not alone. But Martin Luther says, faith alone, sole fide, and he believes in Scripture alone, sola scriptura. Well, wait, wait, wait a minute. Which one is it? All right? This is not in the Bible, sola scriptura. It left it with a real problem. Why is sola scriptura a problem for Martin Luther? Because then he had to ask which books are inspired by the Holy Spirit, and thus should be in scriptures. Because you know, in the first centuries, they had all kinds, hundreds of, of gospels floating around. We have the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's it. Do you know there's a gospel of Thomas, the gospel of Peter, gospel of Mary? That doesn't mean Thomas, Peter, and Mary wrote them. Uh-uh. It just means it's with their name attached and so how could Luther know which one of those Bibles or oh, Gospels are inspired by the Holy Spirit? If you put them all in, you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't be able to fit them in a book. 
So who determined Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were the ones that were inspired and the others are not? Guess what? The Catholic Church. All right. His answer? Well, if a book preaches justification by faith alone, then it's inspired. Otherwise, it's not. Well, the problem is none of them did. None of our Bible books teach us this. Okay, if Martin Luther is correct, that any book that preaches faith alone is inspired in the Holy Spirit, it should be in the Bible. Guess what? I'll write one tonight. I'll write a gospel tonight saying faith alone, and according to Martin Luther, that's got to be in the Bible. Come on. There's no logical reasoning to that. Any book that has faith alone is inspired by the Holy Spirit and should be in the Bible. Again, I'll write one tonight. I'd like to have a book in the Bible. The Gospel According to Father Chris. <laughs> Come on. That's ridiculous. All right, so as a national... Um, okay, this is interesting. At the National Baptist Convention in 1910... Gerald Bernie Smith reviewed every way he could think of to determine which books should belong in the Bible out of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And he found every attempt insufficient. You know the conclusion he finally came to? He said there's only one way. You have to have a divinely protected teaching authority to determine what books were in the Bible. Guess what? That's called the Catholic Church. It's called the Magisterium. And it has been choosing the books of the Bible since its inception of, of, of Christ. And since the time of the scriptures were written, the church has determined what ones are, are, are uh, inspired. Now, let's get into the biggest reason, the biggest problem Martin Luther had at all, indulgences. He had a problem. It was the sale of indulgences in his dio diocese that really began his protest. And you know what? Rightfully so. I'm not going to sit here and try to justify it, but I want to explain it. Okay, what happened was the bishop had allowed indulgences to be preached in his diocese in exchange for a sum of the money of the revenue raised. That money was supposed to go to rebuild St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Now, how was it that something spiritual, like indulgences, what are an indulgences? Indulgences is the complete remission of the temporal punishment for sins already forgiven. Because when we're forgiven of sin, we're not completely off the hook. Our sins have consequences. When you come out of that confessional, your sin is forgiven. But what about the punishment? Now, the punishment, eternal punishment, a.k.a. hell, that's gone. But the temporal punishment due to sin, a.k.a. purgatory or purification or breaking of attachments, because I could confess gluttony. But, and I'm forgiven a gluttony when I come out of that confessional, but if I'm still attached to it, all right, then, yeah, I got to break that attachment. And sometimes it's not even sinful. Right now is the kickoff of Michigan football versus Penn State. They're both undefeated. Now, I could go into the confessional and confess, Father, I've, I've really maybe wasted some time this week. I watched that Michigan football game. But when I come out of it, yeah, I'm sorry, but I'm probably going to watch another game. It doesn't even have to be sinful. It could be just an attachment. I'm working on it. The one time, you know, we tried to bargain with God. When Ohio State played Michigan last year, I said, Lord, I will not watch this game. My expectation was then he would let Michigan win. <laughs> That's not how it works. So when we come out of that confessional, we may still have some attachments, even non-sinful. All right? And so how did something spiritual, like indulgences, the forgiveness of not only the sin in confession, but the consequences of the sin, the punishment we are due after the forgiveness is kind of like the boy you've heard me say who breaks the window and then 
His dad says, you're forgiven, but then he grounds him, right? Because there's consequences when the father told him not to do it. God tells us not to do it. We do it. We're forgiven, but then there's consequences. Now that's called temporal punishment. Now an indulgence wipes that away too. Confession wipes away the guilt of the sin and the indulgence wipes away the punishment afterwards. It's a beautiful gift. It's not, I had somebody after I did my indulgence talk once say, Father, that's the problem with the Catholic Church. It's a bunch of rules and regulations. It's not rules. You know what indulgences are? They're a gift. They're a gift of extra credit of grace. Amazing. But how did they come to be sold? That was the problem. The problem wasn't that indulgences exist for Martin Luther. The fact is that they were sold. He was right. I'm not going to argue with him. But here's how it came to be. I'm not justifying it, but I am going to try to explain it. Since the Bible says that almsgiving, and that's giving donations, was necessary charity, the theory was that donations could count as a form of penance. Because the donor truly gave sacrificially from his heart. This is almsgiving. So if it's a true penance and the, and the, and the, the sinner gives out of his heart sacri sacrificially and gives that money as a donation in charity, it is an act of penance. <clears throat> and therefore the church said, you should be able to get an indulgence. So the church didn't say um, that indulgence will cost you $10.50. The church said if you did almsgiving and you gave to any charity, not just the church, any charity, it was an act of penance. So you see where it got twisted? So an act of almsgiving, which is giving a donation to a needy, the Bible says is needed charity. We have to do it. So the church said if the Bible says giving a donation to an act of charity is an almsgiving, and that means it's an act of penance, and therefore it should be able to be an indulgence. That was twisted. To say that the church was charging for indulgences, it was not. You know what ended up happening? Now the church does not allow indulgences with donations, which I think is wrong because it got so twisted. It got so twisted. So they believed it could count as a form of penance because the donor truly gave sacrificially from his heart. That's the whole purpose of an indulgence. Unfortunately, the practices became understood to be buying remittance for punishment, buying your way into heaven. How many times as Catholics have we heard this? It's misunderstanding. Now, I'm not saying it wasn't abused. If a priest did, and I heard there were two in history that they know of, that says this indulgence cost you this much money, hand it over, then yeah. But if any donation to any charity of any act of of almsgiving is acceptable for the indulgence. There's nothing wrong with that. The Bible tells us to do that. Does this make sense? Does this make sense? All right, since donating to obtain an indulgence could be penitential, it was concluded that one could donate to obtain an indulgence on behalf of a soul in purgatory. I think that's amazing. In the popular mind, however, you were buying an indulgence. And you were told if you didn't give money to the church, you wouldn't get to heaven. Misconception. Such a petition was not supposed to be that way. It was not supposed to be automatically, and even today the church doesn't teach, just because I go through the actions of an indulgence doesn't mean I automatically get waived of all sin and punishment. I have to have the right heart. I have to be in a state of grace. I have to have no attachment to sin, even vino. This was the good intention of the church that was misapplied. Imprudent, but well-intentioned. But the black eye we have gotten from this, I could do an entire series on it. We are guaranteed infallibility in the church regarding faith and morals, but we are not guaranteed impeccability. We are not promised that we won't have priests and bishops make mistakes. That's not part of infallibility. 
And fallibility is the teaching chair of the magisterium that is protected by the Holy Spirit. So Luther was right to be concerned about this, but totally misgot the intention. All right. Luther was right to be concerned, but they were, this was not church teaching. Church teaching was not to hand me money and then your soul gets to heaven. No. Indulgences do not ensure one's salvation. All right? Performing the external work of an indulgence, like contributing money in this case, does not automatically free a soul from purgatory. Nor do indulgences free one from the guilt of sin. That happens in the confessional. It frees you from the punishment. God's intention or intervention through indulgences involves the church. He made it this way. God gave us the church as a tool of grace in regulating the spiritual lives of the faithful. How do we know this? Matthew 16, 18. This is powerful. All right. Last little bit here. God gave us the church to get to heaven. Let's watch a quick video on Martin Luther. Okay. Let's watch it. And I'm sorry. You know what I did again? I did it again. Um, I have a video, and this is not watching the video, my mistake. See my video on this topic. <laughs> it's, sorry, Brother Mark, uh, the, the slide that should be up is the plenary indulgences. This is a video that I did, a talk that I did explaining everything about plenary indulgences if you want to go deeper. It's on our YouTube and Facebook pages. So sorry, see this video. I'm not playing it, my mistake. All right, so basically Luther protested this misuse. Rightfully so, but at what cost? At what cost? That's a big price to pay, risking the salvation of billions of souls because of a misunderstanding on selling versus donating. In 1517, then, he published the 95 Theses in protest. But soon he went way beyond just those simple protests. He quickly mixed his position with unjustified doctrinal innovations and what's been described as bullheadedness. My way, you have to accept, he said. He attacked the papacy and called it the Antichrist. And he envisioned himself as the head authority. Can we sense a little pride here? This isn't all bad because God sometimes uses heresy to define doctrine. This was a major heresy. And boy, the counter-reformation that happened after the Reformation really defined doctrine. We defined purgatory. We defined all kinds of stuff. But many of the German princes, you know what really happened with the Reformation? Many of the German princes saw a chance. Everybody looks for opportunities to strike at the Catholic emperor in that, at that time period, and the Italian-dominated papacy, which the Germans hated. And so they transformed a religious debate into a political one. This is why there was turning against the Pope. Luther actually didn't agree with this. But he had little choice. He had to support those who had supported him. Kind of sound like a, a Democrat or a Republican. The dividing of Christendom into these warring theological and political factions now began. And the life of the world has never been the same. What a shame. Now, Carl Keating, the founder of Catholic Answers, one of my favorite places to go when I do research. Catholic Answers is outstanding. Um, let's look at our next slide. Martin Luther, father of the Reformation. Now, Carl Keating asked, should we have celebrated the Protestant Reformation on its 500th anniversary back on Halloween 2017? Halloween 2017 was the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And the founder of Catholic Answers asked the question, should we have celebrated it? His answer... No. It was the greatest disaster the West has ever suffered over the last millennium. It brought theological confusion, political turmoil, and decades of war. 
The religious wars of the 16th and 17th century killed the same percentage of people as World War II. But worse than the loss of physical life is the eternal loss of souls, the greatest tragedy of all. So he said, why do we celebrate that? Well, nobody's denying much was wrong with the Catholic Church. There was, but remember, the Catholic Church is both human and divine. In her divine nature, she will not fail. You're protected by the teachings of the Holy Spirit, but the church is also human. In her human nature, she will fail. But remember, you don't leave Jesus because of Judas. You've heard me say that. Now... Much was wrong with the Catholic Church during Martin Luther's time in the 15th and 16th centuries. Personal morality was lax. Corruption was widespread. Nobody's denying that. And there were some bad popes during Luther's era. But guess what? It was way worse in the 10th century. Nobody knows this. There was way more corruption, way more bad popes in the 10th century than Martin Luther's time in the 15th and 16th century. And you know what? The church of the 10th century needed reform, not revolution, and it happened. And from that period all the way to the Reformation was unprecedented. Pure Christian, Catholic, virtuous living. Now, the High Middle Ages was the era in which the Catholic principles most effectively, but not perfectly, developed Western society. And that's what we're losing today. We're losing Western society. By the turn of the 1500s, we were in trouble again. This lasted about 500 years. You notice the pattern every 500 years? 10th century, we were a mess. We fixed it. There was reform, not revolution. 500 years was good, then we got in a mess again. Then in the, in the uh, 1600s, they didn't have a reform, they had a revolution. That's the Protestant, even though the name is Reformation, it was a revolution. We only needed a, ref a reform. We didn't need a revolution, we got a revolution this time. Maybe God allowed it because we didn't learn from the first time. We didn't learn from the 10th century. So by the 1500s in Martin Luther, Christendom was in trouble again. But there was not, Carl Keating said, a need for a revolt. There was only a need for reform. There was a need for reform. And the Reformation, he said, despite its name, was not a reform. It was a revolt, a denial of everything of Christ's church. It did not make church more of what it should have been, one and united, as Paul tells us. It made the church fracture into a 40,000 pieces. Is it better to shatter something into 100,000 pieces or to glue it back together into one nice piece? Instead of gluing it together, together in one nice piece, which Paul talks about, the church is one, it was thrown on the floor and shattered into 40,000 pieces. How can this be better? Well, that's what happened. All right, so we're getting close to the end. Hanging in there, guys. False principles led to false principles. Protestantism was grounded on these wrong principles. Most of all, your own interpretation of scripture. Just the Bible tells you whatever you want it to say. I've had people tell me, well, I interpret the Bible that I can kill somebody. Well, that doesn't go too far. Once you accept the principle that there is no human connected authority to which you must be following in mind and action, and AKA, the magisterium, divinely protected, you're free to use personal rep, uh, interpretation at will. You can make it say whatever you want. And, and, and that's not scripture. And in fact, you could take this concept beyond scripture. It extends to the whole of religion. There's no end to reinterpreting my own way. You know, this is interesting because teaching keeps changing. There is no objective moral truth anymore. There's 40,000 different Christian religions that all believe something different or they'd be the same religion. You know, the Anglican church, that broke off from the Catholic church. 
Then you know the Methodist church? That broke off from the Anglican church. You know the holiness churches? Those broke off from the Methodist churches. And you know those churches broke off into thousands of more. Splintering isn't the answer. John 17, 21 says, they all may be one and should be one. Instead, it's they've all become many. And they all disagree. One man's private interpretation gets reinterpreted by another man, and then that interpretation gets entire, uh, reinterpreted by another. Remember that commercial from the 80s? And so on and so on and so on. This is what we're doing. The problem is there's no more objective moral truth to, to be the foundation. Well, I interpret it this way. Then somebody comes in, reads my writing, and says, well, I interpret it this way. Then somebody comes in and reads their writing and says, well, I interpret it this way. Pretty soon you have 40,000 of them. How can this be good? It's not. All right? One man's interpretation is reinterpreted, and then another. And this, you know what? They, uh, the theologians say this is interesting. It was this and not paganism that led to today's secularism. Everything kept changing. I interpret it this way. I interpret it this way. I interpret it this way. Pretty soon you interpret it all the way to marriage can be redefined. Life can be taken in the womb. You see how that happened little by little? Pretty soon Okay, yeah, marriage is only between man and a woman ordained by God. Then it becomes marriage is only between a man and a woman, but it's not ordained by God. Then all of a sudden, it's marriage could be defined how we want it to be. Now all of a sudden, it's marriage between two men and two women. Now it's going to be marriage between animals and people. That secularism is a result of this. It's not from paganism that this all started. It started because of this fracturing in the Reformation. That's fascinating. You know, they say dark clouds have silver linings. Actually, silver linings have dark clouds. Many good and holy Protestants I've known in my life, I'm telling you, they'll get to heaven before me. I've talked about my Baptist secretary, Peter, my assistant. God bless them. These guys love Jesus. Guys and girls love Jesus. They know that. I have absolutely nothing but the highest admiration for them. But we as Catholics have to also not hide our head in the sand when we're challenged by non-Catholics. We have to understand that Christ established one church, Matthew 16, 18, and there was only one church for 1,500 years until Martin Luther. There was only one church of Christ for 1,500 years. I guess you could say the schism in 1054, perhaps. But there was only Catholicism or orthodoxy together. They believed in the sacraments and whatnot until Martin Luther. Now, does anybody really believe that Jesus would say, you know, I'm going to come to earth to start a church, which he did, but I'm going to get it wrong for 1,500 years until Martin Luther gets it right. Eh, not sure you want to follow that. Did Christ really get it wrong until Martin Luther got it right? Last page. I don't know how to explain that necessarily in the best way, but I can tell you the answer is no. The current canon of Scripture was developed at the Council of Rome in 382 AD under Pope Damascus and then Damascus and then was codified. That included all 73 books of the Catholics of the Bible today, Catholic or non-Catholic, um, or I should say the Catholic Bible. Then this canon was repeated at the councils of Carthage and Hippo in 393 and 397 AD. But then Luther removed seven books, Maccabees, Wisdom, Judith, Tobit. He removed them and considered them that were, had always been considered canonical inspired by the Holy Spirit since the beginning of church history, 1,500 years later, he simply removes them. Really? He rejected Hebrews. He rejected the book of Revelation. Is this the guy that really millions, hundreds of millions of people want to follow? I just raised the question. I'm not saying he didn't have some good points, the abuses and things like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. But now when you get into the theology, you got to be really careful. 
He called the epistle of James an epistle of straw because James 2, 14 through 26 conflicted with his personal theology on good works. Really? You're going to go with a guy in the 1500s or you're going to go with 1500 years of church teaching through the magisterium established by Christ? He also added the word, as we said, alone in Romans 3.28. He also added the word only in Romans 3.20. And in Romans 4.15, he also inserted the word alone. Now, I'm running out of time, so I can't show the video. I, it's, it's a longer video. It's, a, it's several minutes. So I'm running out of time. I can't show, but I'll try to get that up at another time. It is a, a great video about some of the mistakes. You know, they found 1,400 errors in Martin Luther's translation of the Bible into German. 1,400. He didn't know Greek. He had li limited knowledge of Hebrew, and he's translating the Bible? No, I'm not condemning him. I think his heart was in the right place. But we got to go and ask ourselves, is this who we want to follow? Okay, 1,400 errors saying that you can't dispute me. This, I'm just summarizing the video. The video basically has quotes of him saying, I've said it, that's the way it is. I changed scripture, that's the way it is. You're going to have to deal with it. Eh. Now, he was particularly damning of the Jews saying that the Jews had betrayed and murdered Jesus and he advocated brutal violence against them. Now, that doesn't fly today. Due to these violent anti-Jewish beliefs, many historians now have made the links between his work and the anti-Semitism of the Nazi party of the Third Reich. I bet you've never heard this. Though Luther's damn um, Okay, here's what's interesting. Even though Luther's damnation of the Jews came on religious grounds, the Nazis condemned the Jews on racial grounds. His intrinsic position in Germany's intellectual history, he was German, allowed members of the Nazi party to use him as a reference point to support their anti-Semitic policies. But you've never heard that. Now let's look at our next slide. You know, he left the church and married a nun. Here she is. There's her picture. He smuggled her out of the convent in a fish barrel. Now, what about her vocation? What about her vows? He smuggled her out in a fish barrel and ran away and married a nun. Again, not condemning him. I don't know his reasons. I'm not judging him. But I'm asking his actions are, is that the person we want to follow? You know, he secretly arranged for the second marriage of somebody who was already married, so he endorsed polygamy. This is all, you can look this up. This is all proven. And do you know he said women are made for only two things, being wives or being prostitutes? The only two things women are made for, being wives or being prostitutes. So again, we have to ask ourselves, is this really the chosen man that God said, I'm going to get the Bible wrong for 1,500 years and I'm going to send this prophet to get it right? We got a lot of questions here. So I finished with the 95 Thesis, the famous example on Halloween of 1517. It's celebrated as the birth of the Protestant Reformation because Martin Luther nailed 15 theses to the doors of the church castle in Wittenberg in Germany. Well, we have no proof of that. But people, if you read the YouTube comments, and I know I'm going to get a bunch of them on this talk, how dare I speak ill of the man who tried to fix all the corruption of the Catholic Church. I'm not arguing we shouldn't corrupt, fix the corruption in the Catholic Church. The church is human and divine, but you don't change the divine part. You want to fix the human part? Go right ahead. Hats off to you. But you don't fix the divine part. He rewrote it. That's the issue. Not condemning Martin Luther for trying to clean up abuses, just saying you don't rewrite church teaching. 
that we're not, what he nailed to the door was not a manifesto of the Reformation, but just simply propositions for public debate. They did not deal with any of the doctrines that came to be what we know as Protestant theology. And this is the 95 Thesis. Take a look at brother. Mark's going to put on the screen. This is Martin Luther nailing the 95 Thesis to the door. But again, we have no historical proof of this. Okay, we don't know if it really happened. But what he nailed didn't make any reference to justification by faith alone or sola scriptura. It's kind of weird. Luther's main concern was the church's penitential system, indulgences. Again, I just explained to you the misunderstanding of indulgences. Is that a reason to risk your soul? Because there's a misunderstanding of a few churches that allowed you to donate and you took it to mean charging? I mean, that's call, talk about cutting off your nose despite your face. Whoa. I mean, that's like going to 25 years of prison for eating the last piece of pizza that you thought was yours and ended up being your co-workers. Mia Copa. I won't do that again. But to go to prison for 25 years for a misunderstanding? Whoa. The church's response was in the papal bull of 1520 by Pope Leo X, Exerge Domini. Even when we recognize the need for reform, this does not mean that we should separate from the communion of the Catholic Church, as John told us. Setting up our own version of the church. I can't say it enough. We don't leave Jesus because of Judas. Not all the 95 theses were bad, however. People don't think this either. People think that these are just the top 95 evils of the Catholic Church. <laughs> they weren't. It comes as a surprise to many, but many of them agreed with church teaching. They were just points of public discussion. The church rejected some of them and others they didn't. So there is this split today that even Martin Luther didn't intend. For instance, his position, and this is where I truly will finish, Mary in the Eucharist. How about this quote? I always like to read this quote and say, who said this? Who said this? We are all children of Mary. Mary is the mother of Jesus and the mother of us all. If Christ is ours, his mother is also ours. She, the lady above heaven and earth, here passes the woman who is raised far above all women, indeed above the whole human race. No woman is like unto thee. Thou art more than an empress or a queen, blessed above all nobility, wisdom, and saintliness. This is about Mary. We are children of Mary. Who said that? Martin Luther. Now the Protestants today reject Mary. Martin Luther did not reject Mary. Let's look at our next slide. Look at this quote. One should honor Mary as she herself wished and she expressed it in the Magnificat. How then can we praise her? The true honor of Mary is the honor of God. The praise of God's grace, Mary does not wish that we come to her, but through her to God. That's Catholic teaching. So when anybody says today, oh, I'm a Protestant, I reject Mary, well, say Martin Luther didn't. Martin Luther said to honor her. You know, it's rumored that he prayed the rosary to the end of his life. I know some people will dispute that, but that's, that's what's said. And he believed in the Eucharist. In that video I couldn't show, it talked about how he believed in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, not a symbol. It is rumored that, that Martin Luther even said, it is easier to live as a Protestant, but it is better to die as a Catholic. How about that one? But we don't know for sure, but it makes a lot of sense. You know, Benedict XVI said, don't just see what divides us, see what we have in common. We just listed a bunch. I know I was a little rough here, pointing out a lot of faults in Martin Luther, a lot of misteachings, but you know what? He honored Mary. He believed in the Eucharist, and he believed in Scripture. Let's focus on that basis of commonality and not all the division. Let's understand the division. That's why I gave the talk I did here today and why we're Catholic, trying to defend our Catholic faith. 
but we bear, most of all, the common thing is we bear the witness to Christ. God bless you. I had some other slides I want to show. I, I guess I will show one. Please become a Marian helper. Visit micprayers.org and receive all the graces of our masses, prayers, rosaries, penances, just like you were a Marian priest or brother. And lastly, um, if you're in the South Carolina area, I know that this, this video will be timed, but for the next couple of weeks, if you watch it, I'll be in South Carolina in Greenville on October 28th and 29th. I'm speaking on the 29th, which is just two weeks from Saturday today. Please join us. If you would like, the information's there on your screen, meconferencesc.net or email peterjames at marion.org. You got all that? <laughs> Praise be to God. <laughs> Praise be to God. And through our beautiful church, may many graces be upon you. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. The talk is ended. Thanks be to God. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>